Well, good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church here in Baraboo. Soloist David Gilmore and myself, Pastor Lisa Newberry, are so happy to be worshiping together with you this morning. Let's begin our time of worship in prayer. Let's bow our heads together. The Spirit of God calls us from many places. Some of us from busy homes with many people. Some of us from life alone. We are part of the family. This week has been different for each of us. Some of us have had happy news we want to celebrate. Some of us have faced grief and need to cry. We are members together of God's family. We all come to the same time and place, all of us seeking God's presence in our lives, all of us seeking God's presence with each other. Together, we become God's family. Lord, meet us here this morning. Join us, open our ears to your message, and bless us from this time together. Amen. There, go ahead. The pieces I will be singing uh, this morning are from the hymn book, Worship and Rejoice, uh, by Hope Publishing. The first hymn is Shine, Jesus, Shine, Words and Music by Graham Kendrick. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, Consume all my darkness, shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on us. Shine on us. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Well, today we continue in our study of the parables. Again, today we hear a familiar story, but we listen for what new thing God might say to us through it. Matthew 25, verse 14, the parable of the talents. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them, to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. 
The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed me two talents and see, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May God bless this reading to our understanding. Once upon a time, following an exceptional stewardship drive, everyone in the church was inspired to use their talents for the ministry of that particular church. One man in particular went to his pastor and said, Reverend, I have only one talent. The pastor asked, what is your talent? And the man said, I have the gift of criticism. The pastor thought about this and finally replied, you know, the Bible says that the guy who had only one talent went out and buried it. Talents, God-given talents, we, we all have them. And today we read a parable about how God expects us to use them. This is a familiar and somewhat simple parable, really. But sometimes it is the simplest of God's instructions that I think turn out to be really difficult to put into practice consistently. So let's begin by looking at the scripture. It's always fascinated me that each person in this parable receives a different amount of money to steward while their boss is away. You would think that Jesus would say something along the lines of, how we are all given equal talents and equal gifts. But he doesn't. Each servant gets a different amount. But you will also notice that no servant is left out. Everyone gets at least one talent, but not everyone gets the same. I suppose this reflects the truth of our lives in many ways. I remember when I had just started out at a job at the MS Society in Waukesha, and I was sitting around the table eating with my new coworkers, 
We were supposed to take a certain amount of time for lunch, but it seemed like a less formal place to work, and I observed over the days that not everyone hurried back to their desks. So one day I made the very poor choice to not be overly attentive to the clock myself. Later that afternoon, my boss sauntered by and mentioned my tardiness. I had to learn. I was new. I was inexperienced. I was the one talent employee. I had gifts to offer, but not bargaining chips to leverage. This is one way we might find ourselves in the one talent category. I am guessing over the course of our lives, we find ourselves in all of the talent categories. Sometimes during certain seasons of life, we have been entrusted with much, lots of gifts, lots of resources, lots of knowledge. Other times we have something to offer, but we don't have access to everything everyone else has. We are not all the same, and we are not all in the same place. We all have different talents and different callings, and we are all at different places along our Christian journey, and we are ready for different things at different times. We are each responsible for what we have been given, no more and no less. And so I suppose this is actually really good news for each of us. Now, before we move too far on from this, there's one more odd little detail that needs to be worked out. One might think that because the third servant got only one talent in some way, he was slighted. But you have to understand what a talent in this story represents. A talent was worth about 20 years wages for the average laborer, or to put a modern dollar amount on it, a single talent would be close to $400,000 in today's money. So it's hard for anyone to say that the, talent, that the hmm, servant who only got one talent didn't get much. Jesus uses an insane amount of money to represent just how precious God's gift is to each of us. Whether you are entrusted with five talents or with one, it is a huge and meaningful gift that we are given. And of course, with a huge and meaningful gift comes huge responsibility. At least that's what we learn next as Jesus tells of how each of the servants responded and how the master responded to them upon his return. First of all, we hear about the servant with five talents and the servant with two talents. They take those and put them at risk and put them to work, and for their efforts, they double their gifts, and they are praised, and they are invited to share in the joy of the work of their Lord. The third servant, however, he did nothing with his talent. He didn't risk it, he didn't use it, he didn't double it either. He buried it and let it sit, doing nothing. The master is very displeased with this servant. He calls the servant out, you wicked and lazy servant. I have given you a great gift, a great responsibility, and what have you done? You've done nothing. And Jesus is clear. There is no joy in his future. Now, we know parables teach us about the kingdom of God, teach us about how God wants us to order our hearts and our lives and our community. So what does this parable teach us? To put our portfolios on high risk all the time? I can't believe that's the point of the text. We do, however, believe God has entrusted us all with talents, with talents and resources and gifts, just like the servants. And so I guess the big looming question is, what are we doing with those things? 
These parables are written in such a way that when we read them centuries later, it is very obvious who the good guy and who the bad guy is in the story. However, we have to remember that Jesus was well aware of human nature, well aware that we are frail and flawed and needing constant direction. I think although we should learn from the lessons presented and put them into action in our life, we must be careful not to be too judgy as we read them. Because the truth is we have probably all played all these parts over the course of our lifetimes and may well play them again in the years to come. It's easy to be the one talent servant, not risking, not doing, but there's no reward with it. I wonder how that servant spent his time. Somehow I envision him pacing around the place where he had buried his treasure, making sure it was safe and undisturbed. Or maybe he forgot about it and went on with his life. Who knows? But I can't see that he had the joy of watching his investment grow or watching his talents help those around him. At first blush, it may seem to be more difficult to be the five talent or the two talent servant, hardworking, risking, reaching out, but the rewards are great also. The five and two talent servant both doubled what they had. This must have felt really good to them felt worthwhile. Now, I must admit, I read this parable differently in this time, in this place, than I ever have before. Usually, if I'm honest, I think of myself as the two-talent servant, not the most gifted, but trying to use what I have for the work of God nonetheless. These days, I Many of us, I suspect, feel a little bit more one talenty. Much of what I am good at doing, what I enjoy doing, what I offer to God, I simply can't these days. We haven't been worshiping or meeting together for months. I cannot go to nursing homes or hospitals. I can't throw dinner parties in my home or even hug people that I love in the streets or at the store. All of these modes of joy are cut off for the moment. And sometimes I might even feel as though I am the one pacing back and forth, watching the hole where my talents rest, waiting for the day I can get them out again. I know we all feel a certain amount of loss these days, things we like to do, things we enjoy doing, things we find meaning in are not easily possible at this moment. In many ways, this parable speaks to me more urgently today than it ever has before. It is abundantly clear that we are not allowed to bury the talents that God has given, not even to let them rest for a while. What the Lord has given us, we are to be using for the work of the kingdom. Now this means I can't, in good conscience, sit and pout about what I can't do. I need to find a way to dust off those talents and put them back to work in new ways in brave ways, in creative ways. We all do. Because God's kingdom isn't waiting. The work still needs to be done. And the laborers still are few. I won't pretend this call is easy. Truthfully, I still don't have it all figured out. I'd say I'm at about one and a half talents right now. But the call, the mandate is clear. It is always the same. How do I use the resources that God has given me in this time and place 
for the betterment and the building of the kingdom? How do I invest them in God's love and holy words and watch that investment be used by our holy parent where and when God wills? I used to be very clear about these answers for myself, and now the answers are a little fuzzy. But as I work and pray and read God's word, they are again becoming clearer. This is the task we are all invited to today. How can we be the men and women God created us to be right here and right now? What gifts do you have? And how can you use them for God's glory? Today is the day to unbury any talents you have let rest during these days of change, to dust them off and recommit them to the kingdom. May it be so for all of us, and may our efforts be blessed and our light shine brightly. Amen. The hymn is Take My Life, written by Francis Havergal and the music by Henry Milan. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold, not a might would I withhold. Take my love, my God, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. Let's bow our heads in prayer. God of sunshine and shadow, God of pain and joy, we lay before you now our mingled stories of success and failure, acceptance and rejection, happiness and sadness. Relate to each of us in the way in which we need you most. Let your spirit, which has come to people in times of articulated need, as well as in moments of complete surprise, mediate your presence to us now. Claim our highest thoughts, our best intentions, our dearest self-interest. Hold before us the cross of our Savior, that we may understand the mysteries and complexities of human existence, and know that suffering is part of the nature of life. But show us also the resurrection and remind us of the power to triumph over adversity and opposition. Enable us to put our faith in you, to live steadfastly from day to day, seeing an outcome we cannot presently reach 
and worshiping a master we cannot presently touch. Reveal to us an inner ground of certainty in a world of change and upheaval. Let us walk as those who have heard a higher calling and live as those who have been shaped for a higher destiny. Give strength to the weak and hope to the depressed. Touch with your healing hand the fevered brow and the tortured body. Soothe with your gentle voice the disturbed mind, the anxious heart, and the grieving soul. Open to us the benefits of your written word and teach us to listen for the voice that whispers from its pages. Keep us in safety. Visit those in prison. Watch over the poor and homeless and deliver us from all complacency that your kingdom may be known among us and your name honored in all we think or say or do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, it is good to be together in this time of worship. And yet, even as we leave one another and go out into our lives, I remind you and I promise you, you do not go alone. You go with the grace of God, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ in the companionship of the Holy Spirit now and always. May God bless us and keep us until we are gathered together again. Amen. The last hymn is, I'm going to live so God can use me, an African-American spiritual. I'm going to live so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm going to live so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm going to pray so God can use me anytime, Lord, anywhere. I'm going to pray so God can use me Anytime, Lord, and anywhere, I'm going to work so God can use me. Anytime, Lord, and anywhere, I'm going to work so God can use me. Anytime, Lord, anywhere. I'm going to sing so God can use me any time, Lord, and anywhere. I'm going to sing so God can use me any time, Lord, and anywhere. So I'm going to live so God can use me any time, Lord, and anywhere. I'm going to live so God can use me any time, Lord, and anywhere. <laughs> 